By December 1944, the trains are no longer arriving at Auschwitz, the death factories have been closed and destroyed since many months, and the first Nazi concentration camps have been liberated in the East. So the Holocaust looks like it is over. It is not. As Germany faces inevitable defeat, the Nazis are still determined to kill Europe's Jews. Now begins the final chapter of the Holocaust. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. By the end of 1944, the Nazis have murdered close to 5,750,000 Jewish men, women, and children, as well as several hundred thousand Roma and Sinti and non-Jewish Poles. Close to 3 million Soviet POW have died in German custody, most by deliberate starvation before January 1942. Several hundred thousand more have been murdered in reprisals for resistance and partisan activities. Millions of POW and civilians are held as slaves inside the Reich, at varying degrees of miserable conditions. Inside the concentration camp system, 1,650,000 people from across Europe have been held in slavery and systematic torture. Of them, over 950,000 have been murdered by being worked to death or execution. In December 1944, 700,000 remain in the camps. Of them, about 200,000 are Jewish. They are the last survivors of the Nazi genocide of the Jews. That they are at all alive at this point is part of the Nazis' last-ditch effort to maintain their war industry. With the need to rapidly increase production in the spring of 1944, the Nazis adjust their program of extermination of the Jews, pushing more of their Jewish prisoners into slave labor than previously. This is a significant shift in the workings of the Holocaust. Yes, the Nazis have used concentration camp inmates such as Slavs, prisoners of war, and political prisoners for labor since the beginning of the war. And on a relatively small scale, some Jews have also been used for labor, whether in ghettos, concentration camps, or in extermination by labor programs at camps Auschwitz and Majdanek. But for the most part, that has been relatively limited, and on the whole, Jews have been murdered in extermination camps. The murder of the Hungarian Jews in the spring and summer of 1944 is where we see the new dynamic demonstrated very dramatically. While the majority of Jews are still murdered rapidly upon arrival at Auschwitz, about one quarter of the Hungarian Jews are instead selected for labor. From Auschwitz, they are then distributed throughout a growing network of facilities known as subcamps or satellite camps, and pressed into service as forced laborers. Here, they join dissidents, political prisoners, captured resistance members, homosexuals, and others that the Nazis consider unworthy of life. While life as a slave laborer is thoroughly miserable and carries a high risk of death, it is something of a stay of execution. Some of them will be among barely 300,000, 5% of the Jewish people captured by the Nazis who will survive the war. We should be clear about one thing, though. The final intention for this system is the same as it always has been, the extermination of Europe's Jews. It's just that the Nazis have weak their policy so as to extract every last drop of value from their entirely expendable victims before killing them. These subcamps soon become the largest component of the Nazi mass murder system. The network of subcamps grows up in an ad hoc fashion, and they vary dramatically in size and focus. In 1950, a Polish prosecutor will compile a list of 1,050 camps spread across the territory of the Reich. Others will put the figure slightly higher at closer to 1,100. Those are just the camps run by the SS. On top of that, it is estimated that there are a further 1,300 camps run by other agencies like local councils, private companies, and individuals. The work varies widely depending on the local economy and construction projects. In the Altama subcamp, prisoners work on the construction of thermal electric power plants. In Shechowitz, they clear unexploded bombs from the oil refinery and the surrounding area. In Charlotte Grube, they work in Hermann Göring's coal mine. At first, transfer to a subcamp may seem like a blessing. A Hungarian Jew named Gertrud Deak recalls being sent from Auschwitz to Hessisch-Lichtenau, 
a subcamp of Buchenwald at the end of August 1944. At the camp, there were small barracks consisting of six rooms each with stripes of beautiful tended grass and trees as well as a beautiful shower room which was at our disposal and where we could wash ourselves once a day. We had bunks with straw sacks to sleep upon and though it was quite warm, there was a radiator in every room and we had central heating. We had three extremely good meals and the Zelapel, twice a day, lasting half an hour only in the morning and in the evening. As Diak would say after the war, life seemed to be a paradise, at least for the first few days. However, when work begins on the sixth day, the true nature of the camp is revealed. One group of women is sent to a munitions factory where they work with the sulfur powder. Their skin and hair quickly begin turning yellow and some die agonizing deaths from sulfur poisoning. Diak is relatively fortunate. Although her work is thoroughly exhausting, it isn't actually poisonous. Each day she must walk six kilometers to her workplace and then spends her time pulling heavy wagons loaded with newly made grenades, trying her best not to be crushed by the massive weight. Unfortunately, she also falls afoul of her foreman, who often orders her to collect the human waste that litters the factory floor. Conditions worsen at Hessisch Lichtenau as time goes on. The meager comforts that the women enjoyed on their first days are soon taken away. The shower rooms are closed down, the heating breaks, and the food becomes ever scarcer. As the inmates grow weaker and more emaciated, the guards start thinning the population. One day they claim that 200 volunteers are needed for lighter work assignments. Although she puts herself forward, Deak misses out because she is the 201st volunteer. This tiny quirk of fate will save her life. The apparently fortunate volunteers are taken straight to Birkenau and gassed. Deak will go on to survive the war. Perhaps the ultimate manifestation of the subcamp system is the Mittelbau Dora complex near Nordhausen in Thuringia, which was established by the SS as a subcamp of Buchenwald back in the summer of 1943. By now, Mittelbau Dora is large enough to be considered a main camp in its own right, and by the spring of 1945 has 40 of its own subcamps. Some of these subcamps have themselves swollen to a huge size. Lager Elrich is located at a disused gypsum mine and counts about 8,000 prisoners. Lager Hatzungen counts 4,000 inmates. The prisoners in these subcamps work in mining and various construction projects, including roads and railways and the building of an underground petroleum facility. The most notorious part of the Mittelbau Dora network is the Mittelwerk, the vast underground factory in which prisoners build the V1 and V2 vengeance weapons and engines for the ME262 jet fighter. I talked about this in a recent episode where I touched on Germany's war economy. Mittelwerk is an alliance of Albert Speer's armaments ministry, the army and air ministry, the SS and private business. Conditions in the underground tunnels are murderous from the start. Inmates are forced to work for 12 hours a day with little food, often while breathing in toxic fumes. Those suspected of sabotage are hanged from the rafters. Some 60,000 people will pass through the Mittelbau Dora system. 20,000 of them will die. As of December 1944, there are perhaps only 1,500 Jews working throughout the network who are deliberately deployed to the hardest and most unpleasant work. But as we shall see, that number will increase dramatically next year. Back in Auschwitz itself, the tyranny of the Nazi murder machine is about to face a small but heroic challenge. For months now, the camp resistance movement has been plotting an uprising. A handful of young Jewish women, including Ala Gertner, Esther and Hannah Weissblum, and Regina Savierstein, have been smuggling small packets of gunpowder out from their work at the Weichsel Union Metallwerke. They hide the tiny packages of powder in the false bottoms of food trays wrapped in cloth or concealed on their persons. They do this all while knowing that discovery means near certain death. The women then pass their smuggled explosives to others in the camp like Rosa Robota, who works in the clothing detail. Robota and others then send the gunpowder on to the final link in the smuggling chain, the Sonderkommando prisoners working in the crematoria. Often the packets are concealed in dead bodies sent for cremation. 
using sardine tins, the Sonderkommando, have fashioned rudimentary grenades and demolition charges. They've also built makeshift knives and axes and have a few small arms supplied through the fences by local partisans. The plan is to destroy the gas chambers and the crematoria, kill as many guards as possible, and launch an uprising. Time is limited. The SS don't allow any Sonderkommando to live for more than about four months. Already these men are the 12th Sonderkommando by early October. They learn that their execution is coming soon. On October 7th, they launch the uprising. The Poles in Crematoria 1 kick things off. A witness recalls, they began shouting loudly, attacked the guards with hatchets and hammers, wounded several of them, and they threw rocks at the rest. They soon disarm the SS guards and the capos. They burn one of the particularly sadistic tyrants alive in one of the ovens. Then the Hungarians in Crematoria 3 and 4 join in. The guards soon launch their counterattack, and the sound of gunfire rattles through the crematoria. The Sonderkommando cannot hope to win. Their limited stash of small arms and primitive melee weapons are no match for the guards' machine guns. Soon, the revolt draws to its conclusion. In a last gesture of defiance, the Sonderkommando of Crematorium 4 blow themselves up along with the murder chamber. Outside, the Sonderkommando of Crematoria 2 have managed to cut through the wire and take flight from the camp. But with the assistance of local people, the SS quickly recapture the SKPs. Back at the camp, the retaliations begin. Some 250 prisoners have already died in the uprising. On top of that, after interrogation and torture, about 200 Sonderkommando are executed. Before their death, the prisoners give up the names of some of their female accomplices. After months of torture, including beating, electric shocks, and rape, Rosa Robota, Esa Weizblum, Regina Safierstein, and Ala Gertner are hanged on January 5, 1945. None of the women betray any of the others in the smuggling chain. As she meets her death in front of the assembled female prisoners, Robota's final words are, Be strong and have courage. Those executions in the first week of 1945 are some of the last to take place at Auschwitz. By the end of November 1944, as the Red Army closes in, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler has already given the order to halt the mass murder by gas, destroy the gas chambers and the crematoria, and to evacuate Auschwitz. The decision has two main motivations. One, destroy as much evidence of the Nazi crimes as possible and prevent prisoners telling their stories to the enemy. Two, retain the camp population for armaments production. For Himmler and some other SS leaders, there's also a third, to keep the Jews as possible bargaining chips for a separate peace with the Western Allies. Throughout January 1945, Auschwitz and its subcamps are evacuated, with 58,000 prisoners being sent west. First they go by foot and then open top freight trains to concentration camps in Germany and Austria, including Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Dachau, Flossenburg, Großrosen, Mauthausen, Dora Mittelbau, Ravensbrück, and Sachsenhausen. Behind the marching prisoners, the crematoria are blown up by the SS. When the camp is liberated by the Red Army on January 27th, just 7,000 prisoners will remain. Food supply on the marches is pitiful, and the winter of 1944-45 is one of the coldest on record. Prisoners drop dead from hunger and exhaustion or freeze to death. Those who cannot keep up are shot and left for dead in the fields and ditches. Sarolta Mittelmann, an inmate of Mauthausen subcamp, recalls the hunger of the prisoners on the death marches. On the way, we had very little to eat. Hunger was terrific. The men plucked out grass and herbs, which we boiled. Sometimes we managed to dig out a few potatoes, but whoever was caught was bumped off. Nevertheless, we dared it so badly were we famished. Reska Weiss, a middle-aged woman from Ungva, recalls how she lost track of time during the march. Had weeks or months elapsed since we started on this death march? Neither. Just a few days. But we could measure time only by the number of our dead. We were really no longer human beings in the accepted sense. Not even animals, but putrefying corpses moving on two legs. The Auschwitz Death March is just one of several that will take place throughout the winter and spring of 1945 as camps are evacuated one after another. 
to list just a few. 50,000 prisoners evacuated from Stutthof in January, 40,000 from Großhosen and its subcamps, 30,000 from Buchenwald in early April, and 7,000 from Dachau later in April. Perhaps 700,000 prisoners, about a quarter to a third of whom are Jews, are moved across the Reich over the final six months of the war. About a quarter of a million of these prisoners die or are murdered on these journeys. The result is administrative chaos, overcrowding, starvation, and the spread of diseases. In camps like Bergen-Belsen, the population rises from 15,000 at the end of 1943 to 45,000 by March 1945. In the coming months, as the Allies begin to liberate these camps, there is nothing to prepare them for the horror they are about to witness. The marches of prisoners back and forth across Germany and the growth of the sprawling network of subcamps shows that one of the prevailing myths about the Holocaust is a lie. The myth is that the German people had no idea what was going on in the Nazi camp system. By the end of the war, most towns in Germany and Austria will host a subcamp. On top of that, locals invariably witness the death marches as they pass through towns and villages. Some people watch on, some join the SS in abusing the prisoners, a very few try to supply at least some food or water. A young Bavarian named Benno Gantner manages to capture a group of bedraggled victims on his camera. The population of the Mittelbau Dora complex will swell in March next year when a group of about 10,000 mainly Jewish prisoners from Großhosen are dumped into the system. The inmates become part of everyday life in nearby Nordhausen, and after the war a local teacher will criticize those who claim ignorance of Nazi crimes. Referring to the camp prisoners as zebras on account of their uniform, he says... Everyone heard the zebra columns marching through Nordhausen every morning and every evening. Everyone will have looked at them at least once and seen the men with pale faces dragging themselves along, accompanied by heavily armed SS. How often did a vehicle drive through the lower town in the direction of Weimar, full to the brim with dead bodies on their way to Buchenwald crematorium? Look how many men and women worked with the zebras. Yes, even for the Mittelwerk in Kornstein. Were these men and women so discreet that they didn't even talk about it at home? I could provide many examples of such people. They proved that we certainly did know something about the Dora camp and its prisoners. And there you are. In 2023, we are appalled at the horror of the Nazi murder machine and how Germans could stand aside and let it happen, even support it. We tell ourselves we would never do something like that. But we did. We, as humanity, ordinary people, stood by and let millions die, mostly Jewish Europeans of all ages. And it wasn't only Germans. For anyone that follows my series regularly, it should be clear that the world saw and turned its back. To stand up and fight, or even to reach out a hand and try to help, was the exception. Perhaps understandable when doing so was at the peril of your own life. If you were not inside occupied Europe, simple geography was in your way. But those blanket excuses belies the other reality. In the end, inside Germany and across the world, the hatred found support. People did not stand aside mostly out of fear. They turned their backs because they didn't care, or they felt that there was at least some guilt on the side of the victims. The Allied nations did not refuse to take in hundreds of thousands of refugees because they couldn't. They didn't take them in because they didn't consider them worthy of savior, and that the political price was too high to pay for these specific human lives. Centuries of lies eons of smearing a minority of the world for no other reason than superstition and the convenience of having scapegoats for grievances with no connection to these people's identity whatsoever was what paved the way for a small group to be allowed to perpetrate the biggest genocide in human history. And do not fool yourselves. That story is far from over. Ask yourself, how many times Have you heard someone speaking of how Jews do have a higher control of media or more financial power than others? Think of how many times you have heard or even thought that there must be at least some real reason for the hatred. You might not be an anti-Semite, or you may not think you are, 
But that matters little if you do not understand that every time these lies are repeated, it sharpens the sides that will sooner or later be used to cut down yet more generations of innocent men, women, and children. Never forget. <laughs>